With such a uh, lofty goal as talking about the future of graduate medical education, um, your first question should probably be, who is this guy? And why is he qualified to talk about this? And it turns out I've been a program director for neurology at UCSF now going on 23 years. Um, I've served on the GME executive committee for UCSF, which is the institutional oversight for all the residency programs for 10 years. I spent eight years on the neurology review committee at the ACGME, including two years as chair, so I have some sense of educational oversight. Um, I've also relied on a very extensive report that was published by the Institute of Medicine, which uh, you can Google. It's titled Graduate Medical Education That Meets the Nation's Health Needs. It was published in the summer and revised in the fall of 2014. And I've integrated a variety of other sources, including an array of very smart educators um, who have thought about this problem. And I'd like to create a little vision into the future for you. So what I'd like you to do is imagine that your son or daughter, 25 years from now, wants to become a neurology resident. And imagine what that training might look like for them. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a what, who, where, how, and why. What does GME or neurology need to do in the future? Who do we need to have doing this? Where does the training need to occur? How will this get accomplished? And why should we care about something that's 25 years into the future? So what does GME and neurology need to do? It's actually quite simple. We need to train residents to provide more personalized care, better personalized care, population health, and do it at a lower cost. And that's basically it. Now, let's go back a little bit. How did we get to that point? It turns out that the federal government, through the Medicare and Medicaid programs, allocates $15 billion a year to graduate medical education in the United States. We are the only profession that gets such a heavy subsidy from the federal government. And yet, if you look at our costs as a healthcare costs as a percent of GDP or per capita expenditures on health, we are by far the most expensive country in the world. And yet when you look at healthcare outcomes or healthcare quality, we are at best average. So not surprisingly, the federal government said, well, that's interesting. We need to understand why we only get average outcomes at high cost. So they commissioned the Institute of Medicine to do a study and print a report. And that was the origin of uh, the report that I mentioned to you. And the report basically addresses the central question, how do we as a nation get the best value for our healthcare dollar when it comes to graduate medical education? So there are three things that I mentioned. One is that neurology residency training needs to emphasize personalized care. So this means that going forward, and it's already starting to happen, the ability of trainees to work in collaborative groups, to problem solve, and uh, to uh, take into account the cultural and economic background of their patients will become very important. Now, the other interesting wrinkle here is that personalized care will also include the ability of every physician to take care of certain common problems that physicians face. So, in the IOM report, for example, they discovered that, in fact, many specialists feel uncomfortable taking care of common problems that they see all the time, such as mild depression or anxiety in our patients coming in with a neurologic illness. And per the report, 
in the future, it's part of their vision that we will all be competent to take care of uh, certain common non-life threatening conditions as a part of delivering personalized care that is patient centric. The second thing is that there will be training in population health and there will be uh, competency developed for the use of outcome measures not just for individual patients but for groups of neurology patients for example who share a common neurologic illness. And lastly cost-effective care will increasingly become, and it's already starting to become, a part of uh, one measure of healthcare quality. And this kind of training will include specific education regarding the costs of individual patient care tests, medications. Um, it will also uh, include detailed uh, financial uh, information in a way that we have not uh, dealt with before. In many institutions to this day, detailed information about revenue, cost, what's a write-off, is considered proprietary information by the business that runs a local hospital. And I think um, that will need to change going ahead. So who do we need to train as neurologists 25 years from now? Well, it depends entirely on the skills that we want those neurologists to acquire. But the common program requirements of the ACGME, which writes rules for education for all residents in all training programs, couldn't be clearer, and I quote, residents are expected to communicate effectively with patients, families, and the public across a broad range of socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. Residents are expected to demonstrate sensitivity and responsiveness to a diverse patient population, including but not limited to diversity in gender, age, culture, race, religion, disabilities, and sexual orientation, end quote. So I think these sentiments are actually summarized in the concept of culturally competent care. What do I mean by culturally competent care? What I mean is the ability of providers and organizations to effectively to deliver healthcare services uh, to patients with diverse social, cultural, medical, and linguistic ne needs with the ultimate goal of using all that information to improve health outcomes and quality of care. Now, um, I see patients uh, like I suspect many of you do. And I kind of like to think that maybe I'm sensitive to this idea of cultural competence. Um, yet, if you look at surveys of residents asking them if they are comfortable that they are providing culturally competent care, in fact, uniformly, the surveys say, no, we're not. Now, if you stop for a minute, this makes actually a lot of sense. Um, for example, uh, do I really know what it's like to attempt medication compliance as a patient in the setting of poverty or illiteracy? Or for another example, um, do I know what it's like to be compliant with showing up for a medical visit if I don't have fare to pay the bus uh, to and from the clinic? And the truth of the matter is, I have not walked in those shoes. Um, the issue is not whether I'm sympathetic to the plight of my patients, but the issue is whether I or many of us are culturally competent to understand and act to remove the barriers in the effective care of disadvantaged patients. Now to accomplish culturally competent care, our workforce is going to have to look a lot more like the patients we serve. And um, how large uh, is this diversity gap? Well, it turns out that in California, 36% of our patients are Hispanic, but less than 5% of our physician workforce is Hispanic. Uh, very few physicians come from the lower 20% of, of the lower 20% of family incomes, and so the goal, I think, at this point of creating a diverse physician workforce is going to require 
specific interventions, but the need for, for a diverse workforce is no longer in question. Uh, where does uh, neurology residency training need to occur? The training location uh, for your son and daughter will, will increasingly reflect the environment in which they will ultimately practice. Um, so let's first consider, say, a neurology resident who works with a disadvantaged population at an inner city hospital. It only makes sense to train in, an in this kind of environment for a number of reason reasons. First of all, the population is disproportionately minority of lower socioeconomic status or both. So uh, there's clearly an opportunity to learn about how, how to deliver culturally competent care. And second, there's an opportunity to learn about institutional barriers to care, maybe even how to overcome some of those barriers in a practical way and address in a case-by-case -case, uh, manner some healthcare disparities. In other words, there's an opportunity in the environment to learn how to advocate for patients in a more uh, in a resource challenged environment. Now you might say, we already have this. We have an inner city hospital. We have a big county hospital. Many programs have such an environment and it is true, residents learn. They are very clever. They get, learn some tricks of the trade to advocate for individual patients. However, I would ask the question, is there an effective formal curriculum and practical application in cultural competence in your setting? If so, I've not seen it. Um, is there a, an organized collection of methods that could be used by neurology residents to advocate for patients in an under-resourced environment? I've not seen that either. So while the opportunity is there, the institution is there, the full maturation of such uh, training programs is still lacking. Uh, consider another example. Suppose your son or daughter decided that they wanted to practice neurology in a rural environment. And the first response is going to be, whoa, wait a minute, how can you do that? Uh, you're talking about trying to deliver care to patients in far-flung communities. Um, practical thing. Can you still hear me? Good. Okay. This is a very impractical thing. Uh, and not only that, but how, you know, when you're using your time so inefficiently, how do you actually generate an income to have a sustainable professional life? But putting some of those practical considerations aside, no one would deny that providing rural care rural neurology care is an unmet societal need. Now it turns out in primary care there's already a mixture of centralized training and training in rural communities for a number of primary care programs and that actually could occur in neurology as well. In addition, in the future, telemedicine is going to revolutionize the way in which some of this training occurs. For example, it will be entirely possible for a neurology resident to be rotating in a rural community and through a telemedicine interface, present a patient, show the exam to an attending at a remote site. In addition, when it comes to follow-up visits for chronic illness, there is no reason for a patient to have to drive to and from a clinic at a, at a long distance away. If all that is being negotiated is medication management and symptom management and not the neurologic exam and laboratory testing, this can all be done through a secure telemedicine interface directly into the patient's home uh, and obviate the need for inefficient time travel. Now it'll probably turn out that learning how to be a neurologist in a rural setting will also include learning how to use fewer diagnostic tests and rely more on the history and examination. And in fact, one could imagine that some of the lessons that we learn in this setting are lessons that might at least help inform some of the discussions about how to provide neurologic care in international settings, but that's a, a talk for another time. 
So how will these changes in neurology residency training come about? Well, first of all, we can't be shy about getting rid of some old neurologic structure. Uh, I think the emphasis will be on the development of neurologic skills as opposed to rigidly time-based training. So the 36 months currently in neurology is quite rigid and does not accommodate people who may learn a little slower or a little faster. Um, we need better outcome measures for our residents who work as part of teams and also in their problem solving capacity and uh, a demonstration of cultural competency. You know, it's funny, the only objective measure that we have for performance in residency, there's a lot of emphasis even in milestones on process. The only objective measure that we have is how people perform on board examinations and how programs perform on board examinations. And these are, uh, despite I think the best efforts of a lot of talented examination writers, are still fact-based exams. And in 2016, let alone in the future, most of these facts are available at our fingertips. The need for an encyclopedic knowledge is no longer a necessity. And second, we'll feel our way along the path towards developing these mature training programs that reflect new values, but the message couldn't be simpler. We need to train neurologists to provide better personalized care, population health, and at lower cost. And across the country, many of you may already be involved in training programs that have started down this road and are experimenting with uh, measures of neurologic measures of healthcare quality and cost effectiveness. But the task ahead is enormous. It will take a generation to, to have a diverse uh, physician workforce, even with aggressive outreach programs to attract diverse candidates to medicine and neurology at the secondary school level and in our undergraduate universities. There are also enormous political obstacles to obtaining financial transparency for the fate of GME funds that come to institutions but don't get to programs, detailed financial information regarding the care of patients, uh, and changing the perverse economic incentives that employ skilled house staff at low cost. But the slow march leading to more personalized care, population health at lower cost has already started. So why should we care about the future of GME in neurology 25 years from now? Uh, the changes are just on the right side of history. And we'll do this for the better care of our patients and the improved health of our society. And we'll also do this so that your son or daughter can be the best neurologist of the future they can be. Thanks for your attention.